Hi, everyone. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today for our webinar titled Providing Family Pack Services During COVID-19 Understanding Benefit Changes. We hope you are all doing well and staying safe. My name is Nicole Nguyen, Health Educator at the California Prevention Training Center, the CAPTC, under contract with the California Department of Healthcare Services, Office of Family Planning, is sponsoring today's event. Uh, so before we get started with the webinars, let's go over some really quick housekeeping slides so that you can join us. Um, first, make sure that you check your audio and select your desired settings to join either through your computer audio or to call in through your phone. If your internet is shaky, we recommend that you call in through your phone for the best possible sound. And then also, second, please check that you're able to see the viewer screen with the slides on the left and the GoToWebinar control panel on the right. And then uh, these are just some of the controls. So the first one, uh, this orange box with the white arrow, this is how you can hide or show your dashboard if you don't wanna see it, or if you accidentally clicked it, this is how you can make it appear again. Under that is the audio tab, is where you can change your audio preference at any time. And then third, please submit all your comments and questions via the questions box below. Today's webinar will take about 90 minutes and will include time at the end for the presenters to answer all your questions. So please send in questions throughout the webinar and our speaker will address it, as many of them as possible at the end. The webinar will be recorded and responses to questions not answered today by our presenter will be sent out to participants later along with the recording and the slide deck. There is an evaluation at the end, so please fill it out because your feedback is extremely important to us and help guide us in developing our future content. So a little bit of a background info. This webinar is actually part two, the continuation to our first webinar back in May titled Providing Family Pack Services During COVID-19 Clinical Considerations that focus on the adaptations that clinicians should make in order to successfully provide family planning care during COVID-19 and afterwards. If you have not watched that webinar, we strongly encourage you to go back and watch it because it does have some really important information regarding on how to provide family pack services. We'll also put the link in the chat box. And then for today's webinar, we will provide an update on how family pack services, especially client encounters, have changed since March 2020, focusing on the Medi-Cal and family pack policy for telephonic only remote visits. And then now I would like to introduce our presenter. We are really excited to have Dr. Michael Polakar with us today. Dr. Polakar serves as clinical professor of obstetrics, gynecology, and reproductive sciences at the University of California, San Francisco School of Medicine. From 2005 to 2014, he was the medical director of program support and evaluation for the Family Pack program administered by the California Department of Healthcare Services, Office of Family Planning. He currently serves as professor emeritus of obstetrics, gynecology, and reproductive sciences at UCSF. So with that, Dr. Polakar, the floor is yours. Great. So let me Thank you, Nicole. get that so you can share. We'll share my slide set. There we go, show my screen. Uh -huh. There you go. Okay, just waiting for my slides to come up. Hey, there we go, great. All right, let me make sure that I am full screen here. Yeah. Um, so thank you all for joining us, um, especially for uh, for part two. I'm glad that Nicole was able to explain a little bit of the history of why we're um, why we're doing this. Probably the most important reason is to tell you about uh, a new Medi-Cal and Family Pack policy, which was published on uh, June 23rd, uh, that has to do with uh, telephonic only visits. Uh, it was, it's a particularly important topic because in earlier webinars that I did. Uh, both for the Office of Family Planning, and you may have heard an earlier one in April that I did for Essential Access Health. Those policies were a little confusing at that time. Fortunately, there's much more clarity um, in terms of when you can bill for a telephonic service uh, now in Family Pact and Medi-Cal, and I'm going to try to explain that uh, in detail. And then also, as Nicole mentioned, uh, the previous webinar was primarily on clinical topics. This is going to um, also include uh, some new clinical topics that we haven't talked about before, but in addition, we'll spend a fair amount of uh, time giving examples uh, with, um, with billing. Uh, so first, let me set up the time frame, and uh, that is that I'll be talking a little bit about the family pack policies regarding telehealth before the time of the public health emergency. 
uh, in March uh, 2020, because uh, family packs telehealth policies actually go back about a year and a half uh, for them to cover certain aspects of, um, of telemedicine. Uh, then I'll be spending more time on current policies from the middle of March uh, through the present time. But I do want to remind you that some of the policies that I'm going to be discussing now will sunset. That is to say, they'll phase out after the public health emergency is over. Uh, but of course, we don't know when that's going to be yet. And the uh, California State Department of Health Services hasn't really given us any sort of time frame. Now, I'm sure that at some point, uh, some of you uh, may want to actually look at the original policies. And so I have a very complete listing of references at the end of the presentation. Uh, and as you go through, through those references, all you have to do is click on it and it will have a hot link to the source policy so that you'll be able to, uh, uh, to look at the uh, specific wording of a particular uh, policy. There's also a shortcut, and that is that uh, we have a wonderful web page for Family Pack, which is familypack.org. A section of that is on COVID-19 updates. So uh, if you click on that link, uh, you'll go to this page and you'll see both family packed updates and then as you see up in the right hand corner department of healthcare services uh, COVID-19 updates uh, as well. So if you don't have the handout from this talk you can go to this site and be able to get this information. Now uh, let me start by telling you a little bit about the types of uh, telemedicine visits that were covered um, before the time of the public health emergency and uh, remember that uh, there's a large majority of policies in the Medi-Cal program in California uh, are developed within our state, but some of them are actually driven by uh, Washington, D.C., by the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Now, also remember that um, basically virtually all of family PAC policies are necessarily consistent with Medi-Cal policies. So there is some um, sort of flow through of things that start in Washington, go through the State Department of Health Services here, and then become family pack policy after that. So the type of telemedicine visit that was covered last year uh, in family pack was, was one called a telehealth visit. And remember um, from the earlier webinars, I, I explained some of the features of that. I will do that again. And then after the uh, advent of the public health emergency, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services added on a couple of additional um, kinds of telemedicine visits that are called virtual check-in visits. I will review those for you uh, as well. First is the initial definition of a telehealth visit that is covered both in Medi-Cal, Medi-Cal Managed Care, and in Family Pact. That is defined as a real-time interactive audio-video telecommunication between a clinician and a patient. The clinician has to be a physician, a nurse practitioner, a PA, a certified nurse midwife or a nurse anesthetist. Now, in the earlier version of this, the requirement was that we could only do this for established patients and not with new patients. But that's been waived during the public health emergency. So you can bill for telehealth visits, both with new patients and with established patients. And remember the way that you do that is with standard E&M codes. So if this is a patient that's new to your practice or someone you haven't seen in the last three years, you build up with a 99201 through 204 in family pack. If it's an established patient, uh, then it can be a 992, that's an error, it could be a 99211 through a 214 for, um, for an established patient. The thing that's uh, different with this is that uh, the place of service is O2. Uh, typically in an office visit, it's 11. But in the case of a telehealth visit, the place of service is O2, and you have to put a 95 modifier uh, after the, uh, the E&M code to indicate that it is a telehealth visit. Now, and another reminder is the fact that, of course, a telehealth visit can't be based on history, physical, medical decision making. The E&M code <clears throat> has to be based on time. And so um, through the remainder of this year, these are the time frames, both for a new patient and an established patient, of the, uh, the time that the clinician is interacting with the patient through an audio video connection, or uh, as you'll see in a moment, an audio alone connection. But that time frame does need to be um, documented. Uh, and then you choose the E&M code based on how long that uh, interaction was. 
Another thing that was offered through Medi-Cal and Family Pack before March of 2020 was something called an e-consult. And that is the ability um, for uh, us to be able to get uh, in touch with a, a specialist or a subspecialist to be able to ask questions about the care of a particular patient. And then that specialist is able to bill for the interaction. So if you have a question about a deep implant, a problem with an IUD, a patient who has a complicated um, medical history and you have um, concern about whether or not she could use a combined hormonal contraceptive, you can uh, email a family planning expert who is registered as a family pack provider they can give you an opinion and then they will be able to bill for that using uh, the e-consult code, which uh, in Medi-Cal and Family Pack, the CP code, CPT code 99451. There are other additional codes uh, that are for longer consults, but they are not available in Family Pack. And then there's also another series of CPT codes, which I've listed for you, which require the consultant to give both a written report and a verbal report um, while they are payable by some commercial payers, they are not covered by either Family Pack or by Medi-Cal. So things changed starting in the middle of March, uh, as you know, and uh, basically the first thing that was added as a Medi-Cal and Family Pack visit uh, were the two types of virtual check-in visits. Uh, the first is one which is a discussion typically done over the telephone, although it could be done through a audio video um, connection as well. And it's really intended to decide whether or not the person actually needs um, an office visit. Uh, that has to be a call which is initiated by the patient. Initially, the rule was that that again had to be an established patient rather than a new patient, but that's something which has been waived. There are some rules about how recently a person has previously had an office visit or will have an office visit. The patient has to verbally con consent to having this telephone call. And the way that it's billed is with a HICPIT code of G as in Gordon uh, 2012. So as you have these conversations with, uh, with your patients about whether or not they need to come in, it is a billable service. Of course, it does have to be um, documented. Now, the other type of virtual check-in visit, which is covered, is one that I like to call sort of a mini version of teledermatology. And what that is, is that a patient can take a picture of a skin lesion, basically send that to a clinician uh, in your practice. The clinician can then look at the history submitted by the patient at the photograph and then uh, render an opinion within 24 business hours of what should be done, uh, recommending a diagnosis or a treatment or that the patient come in uh, for a uh, uh, in-person examination uh, in uh, the clinic. Again, some rules about uh, how that should be done independently from other uh, office visits. It has a hit pick code of G2010. So an example of that is that a client has a genital skin lesion, can't really tell if it's a rash or herpes or something else, and she or he is willing to take a photograph of that and submit it to you for evaluation. Uh, that uh, once that's done, that is a billable um, service as well. Now, just one or two other things to say about how telehealth visits, the way that I've just defined them, have changed, is that in the past, there were some restrictions on where the provider was located and where the patient was located. Those restrictions have gone away. So the patient can be at home, she can be in her car, she can be somewhere else, and the provider can either be in the clinic or they can be at home or somewhere else. So uh, as long as this interaction occurs, it really doesn't matter where it occurs. Uh, second is that any phone, tablet, laptop, or desktop can be used um, that allows this two-way interaction. Uh, and I know you'll ask this question, are these visits paid at the same rate as if the patient were seen in the office using the same E&M code? And the answer to that is yes, that there is payment parity in in-person visits and doing these um, telehealth visits the way that I just described them. Now, a problem that we started hearing about, in fact, there were many questions in one, in one of the earlier webinars about this is, well, what if the patient that we've had in our clinic for years just doesn't have access to an audio video platform? They don't have a smartphone, they don't have a computer, they don't have access to that. Well, maybe they do have a smartphone, but their internet access is really um, slow, it's sketchy, it's on and off, it's unavailable, or there are some patients who are actually worried about the number of minutes that they have. And that if they have a long interaction, they'll use up all their minutes for their months and they'll have to buy more. So 
there are some people for whom doing an AV visit uh, is just not realistic. And so the question has come up, can we do these visits by telephone only? And the answer to that is yes. During the public health emergency, telephone only visits to substitute for office visits are covered by Medicare, some commercial plans. It's considered to be an encounter if you're a Title X provider, and they are now covered by Medi-Cal, Medi-Cal Managed Care, uh, and by Family Pact. And when this started was a letter uh, published by the Department of Health Services on June 23rd of 2020. Here's a look at what that uh, looks like, and you'll be able to click on the link here so that you can uh, get your own version of it. It is rather long. It's about 11 or 12 pages. And I'm only going to talk about two pages, the ones that relate um, primarily to uh, the Family Pact. Again, the title is Medi-Cal Payment, meaning Family Pact Payment as well, for telehealth and telephonic communications relative to COVID-19. Uh, and it's how telephonic only visits can be considered the equivalent of that audio video telehealth visit during the public health uh, emergency. There's only one section of it that applies to family pack providers, page seven through page nine, but there are uh, maybe seven or eight pages after that that are specifically guidance for federally qualified health centers, rural health clinics, and tribal clinics. If you are any of those, particularly if you're a federally qualified health center, be sure to read the sections that apply to you and the primary care services that you do as an FQHC. I'm not gonna cover that. I'm only gonna cover the part that specifically has to do with family planning services. So basically uh, what this policy says as it relates to family pack providers is that family pack providers, including but not limited to physicians, nurse practitioners, PAs, nurse midwives, will provide and bill for telephonic visits using appropriate and regular CPT or HCPCS codes that would correspond to the visit if it were being done in person. And as I mentioned earlier, the, uh, for the billing that's done, the point of service is O2, and the modifier that is attached to the ENM code uh, is a 95. Now, the next thing is, is that five conditions have to be met in order to build the ENM code, and I'll list what those five conditions are. First is that documented circumstance involved that prevent the visit from being conducted face-to-face -face need to be documented. And some examples that they give is that the patient is quarantined at home because maybe she or he has been uh, exposed uh, to someone else who has COVID-19. Next is local or state guidelines direct the patient to stay at home, again, because of, of um, uh, quarantine or other um, lockdown procedures that are going on in a particular locality. Or the patient lives remotely and doesn't have access to the internet. The internet doesn't support HIPAA compliance and so on. Most of our patients are going to fall into that third category, where the reason that we're doing this as a telephonic only visit is because of the fact that they don't have access to the internet. And I would go beyond saying that that patient uh, lives remotely. I think they can live anywhere as long as they don't have access to the internet, then you can do this uh, as a telephonic visit instead of as an audio video visit. The second requirement is that the healthcare provider, HCP stands for that, intends for the virtual or telephonic visit to take the place of a face-to-face -face office visit and you document this. The third is that the clinician believes that what's being offered is medically necessary. The fourth is that the covered service being provided is clinically appropriate to be delivered telephonically and doesn't require the physical presence of the patient. So you have to be somewhat selective in being, doc in being sure that you document that this is something which is appropriate for a telemedicine visit and really does not have to happen uh, immediately uh, in the clinic. And then the fifth requirement is that the provider satisfies all procedural and technical components that we would normally do for an office visit. That you document a detailed patient history, describe what services you provided, an assessment of the issues being related, or I'm sorry, being raised by the patient, which in other words is your problem list that you've um, uh, put together for this patient. And then medical decision making is applicable, which includes diagnoses at the end of the visit, your recommendations for diagnostic studies, um, prescriptions, uh, follow-up treatments, or another thing that could be on the list is the need to actually come into the clinic to be seen uh, for a procedure or uh, for further evaluation. So all of those things need to be in your note on the low likelihood that, your, that that visit actually was audited at some point. The expectation is, is that all those criteria would be met 
for doing this visit uh, telephonically. Then the last part of the policy says that if you don't meet all five requirements, that you should use the virtual check-in visit code of G2012, since this was a telephone-only um, conversation. It will pay considerably less, though, than if you use the HICBIT code based on, I'm sorry, the uh, ENN code based on, on time. So this um, table basically summarizes all of Family PAC's uh, policies now about telemedicine visit coverage. They do cover G2010, which is that uh, teledermatology that I mentioned, G2012, which is the short virtual check-in visit by telephone, the e-consult, which is for you to be able to get in touch with a consultant to ask them a question, and then 99201 through 204 for new patients, 99212 through, through 214 for established patients, adding the 95 modifier, which in the past were for only for audio, visi, vi, uh, audio visual telemedicine visits, but now can be substituted with um, telephonic visits the way that I just described them. And by the way, digital e-visits, which means a visit which is basically an email interaction between a clinician and a patient, uh, or the telephone uh, e and codes that are in the CPT book are not covered um, by, uh, by either Family Pack or Medi-Cal. It's the ones that I just uh, explained to you. I just, that before we get to a couple of cases, let me do a quick review of, of uh, some of the things I mentioned last time about telemedicine capability. Remember, there are a number of different telemedicine platforms that you can use in your clinic. The best one is one which is available to you through your electronic health record. And ideally, if you have um, Epic or one of the others, on one side of your screen basically is the video image with uh, your patient. And then on the other side of the screen is her or his electronic medical record. And so you have everything in a single place. Okay? There are also a number of proprietary telemedicine products, um, all of which are HIPAA compliant, have a lot of bells and whistles, but are relatively more expensive. And then uh, quite a number of new telemedicine platforms that had become available just in the last six months. Um, Zoom, DoxyMe, eVisit, um, and so on down the list. It seems like there are new ones every uh, couple of weeks or so that are very simple, have very low fees for being able to uh, sign up to use these as your telemedicine platforms. In fact, a lot of them will give you uh, three months for free just to see if you like it and to get used to it, and then you pay your, um, your uh, monthly fee or quarterly fee afterwards. In addition, during the public health emergency, it's acceptable to use Skype, Apple FaceTime, um, Facebook Messenger video chat, Google Hangouts video uh, for the conversation between the clinician and the patient. But what's most important is that that has to be a confidential conversation and can't be um, open to others uh, on the internet. It has to be closed rather than open facing. Next issue is what about HIPAA requirements? And another way of saying this is what about confidentiality? And the answer is, is that the HIPAA confidentiality regulations historically were rather strict. They have been um, waived or loosened to some degree during the public health emergency for Medicare, Medicaid, uh, correspondingly for, um, for family pact. You know, they didn't get rid of any HIPAA requirements. They just basically said that we won't penalize you for non-compliance. So the basic rule is as long as you make a good faith effort for your telemedicine visits to be confidential, I'll give you some ideas about how to do that in just a second, um, then you will basically be HIPAA compliant uh, in that circumstance. Now what about getting consents for telemedicine visits? That too is something which had been previously expected would be routine for every telemedicine visit. But in California, um, Governor Newsom signed an executive order on April 3rd of 2020, which said that the telehealth consent requirement is suspended during the public health uh, emergency. And so you can continue to choose to get uh, consent, document that in the patient's note, uh, or uh, uh, you can also choose not to document that, not to do that uh, until uh, we hear otherwise about uh, this executive order um, being rescinded. Now, one of the things that I want to add is that I've been doing quite a lot of research on the internet to look for advice about how you do a high quality telehealth visit. And one of the things that I found was particularly from the American College of Physicians who are the internal medicine docs, who I think had some really good ideas about that. And 
first off, if you're not doing telemedicine, to recognize the benefits for your practice. And by the way, if you are doing it and you think about it just being temporary during the public health emergency, here's some reasons that you need to be strategizing about how you will continue to do um, telehealth or telemedicine as part of your practice after the public health emergency is over with. So obviously the main reason that we do this is to keep patients and staff safe by reducing in-person visits and to prevent having to travel to and from the office. But we know even before the public health emergency for, um, for uh, telemedicine visits, either from commercial companies or uh, between clinics and, or practices and providers or in an organization like Kaiser, most patients really love the convenience of being able to do a telemedicine visit and clinicians like it because of the fact that we can work from home. Uh, we don't have to actually drive to, the, to our site of care to be able to do these televisits. Second is that it allows patients to access your practice instead of having the sense of, well, my practice is closed or restricted and therefore I've got to go to the emergency room if I'm having heavy vaginal bleeding or having them go to a commercial telemedicine service. It's a way of retaining your patients. And therefore, if you do that, you enable continuity of care. They do have some advice about utilizing visual assessment and physical exam. You can actually do a lot more than what you might think on a telemedicine um, visit with good quality audio. It allows you to save personal protective equipment for in-person visits at your clinic. And let's face it, many clinics have noticed a substantial drop-off in the number of patients that they've been seeing, both family planning clinics, FQHCs, community clinics have kind of gone up and down in their patient volume, although many clinics took a fairly big hit in uh, April, May, and even into June. And so in order to maintain financial viability, it's important for you to be able to continue to see patients, bill correctly, and be paid for the services that you're doing. Now, the next set of things that ACP recommends is some ideas about practice logistics. Number one, if you're doing video visits, to announce the availability on your website. If you have a patient portal, certainly on your phone system, or sending an email to your patients to let them know that you are offering that. Make sure that your scheduling staff has a script that they can use to describe uh, how to schedule a, tele on a telemedicine visit with your particular practice, and prepare a simple patient guide on how to connect for the visit and email it to the patient in advance. In fact, what many clinics do is they give the patient an opportunity, it's not a requirement, but an opportunity to actually call in in advance and to do a practice video visit with one of your front desk people or one of your IT people just to get the hang of how to do it before they're actually going to have their scheduled visit uh, with a clinician. But having a simple patient guide prepared in advance can be um, quite helpful. And the ACP gives you some examples of what they look like. When you're conducting the visit, and these are some rules for the clinician, the clinician should be in a quiet, private, well-lit room. Ensure that the patient can see and hear you clearly. That's one of the first things you ask. Can you see me? Can you hear me? And if the patient says, no, not very well, but I particularly can't hear you, then you might want to switch to a telephone call. And of course, that would be the clinician calling the patient rather than the other way around. Verify that the patient's identity with at least two identifiers, explain the benefits and the limitations of a telemedicine visit and obtain a consent that, um, if that's something you want to do or you don't have to do. And then um, keep your electronic health record available either on the same screen or a second device. And what most clinics have had to do in this circumstance is on one side of the screen is the audio video with the patient. On the other side of the screen, hopefully you have a big screen, uh, or this could be your cell phone or somewhere else, so, or a tablet or something like that, is you've been able to call up the electronic medical record and that's where you're going to be uh, typing in notes, checking labs and that sort of thing. But you do want to acknowledge to the patient that when you look away from the camera in the direction of the second device, that you explain to her or him that you're checking labs or writing notes so that they don't think that you're not focusing on, on them and, and losing um, eye contact. Other things about the clinician setup for the televisit is to ensure a clutter flip free environment Check behind it and make sure that you don't have personal artifacts and uh, remove them. Try not to make it too busy like a map in the background. Look professional as you would in an in-person visit in clinic. So if you normally wear a white coat, do that during your televisit. Smile, you're on camera. Position the computer or the tablet or the phone two, way, uh, two feet away uh, at eye level. 
make sure that the door to your room is closed. And in fact, you might even put a note on the door asking people to stay away and um, that you're doing a confidential visit. The patient can actually show you monitoring data. So if you want to know her blood pressure and she has a blood pressure cuff at home, you can actually ask her to show you the reading on the blood pressure cuff um, or the blood pressure monitoring um, machine, and then you can document that. Or, or she can read it, but if you want to do it directly, you can uh, do that with a video camera. And lastly, have a clock or a watch nearby so that you can record the length of the visit. Because again, you have to document how long the face-to-face -face time was with the patient, um, uh, either with your telephone call or with your video hookup, um, uh, in order to be able to choose the right level of the uh, uh, evaluation and management code. Now, the ACP also has some really helpful tools that have to do with literally doing a physical exam with an audio video hookup. And they say that you can do a visual assessment just by your initial look at general appearance, skin tone, eye redness, respiratory rate, and so on. And then with patient assistance, they can palpate uh, areas, um, show you close-up camera views of skin lesions or their oral pharynx. I've already mentioned uh, home monitoring uh, devices. And they have actually a lot of uh, job aids, basically, uh, that will help you to be able to do uh, even more of a physical assessment at home. And then uh, now getting near the end of the ACP recommendations, they give us some ideas about how to document a telehealth visit. We should always start our note with, this is a telemedicine visit, do note whether this is an audio video visit or whether it's a telephonic only visit. Um, whether the patient uh, consented for the televisit, the patient location at the time of the visit and the provider location at the time of the visit. Who else is present with the patient? Is there a family member, a friend, a partner that's also being seen uh, on camera or off camera? Whether you used an interpreter, which language and identification of who the interpreter was, and then any other unusual components of the in-person uh, of, of this visit. So basically, it's what we would typically document at the time as an office visit, but with a little bit more detail, um, particularly in terms of the location of the provider and of the patient, and clearly flagging the fact that this is a telemedicine visit rather than an inpatient visit. All right, so now let's um, do a couple of um, of um, cases, and I want to let you know in advance that the focus of the cases have to do with prioritization templates. We talked about that last time, but that is hopefully a policy that you have in your office which says which patients or which conditions, I should say, uh, are appropriate for doing a telemedicine visit as, a, as opposed to those conditions where a patient should come in for an in-person visit. What you should do for protection of patients and staff during an office procedure some ideas about curbside pickup, clinic and pharmacy dispense medications, and a little more about depo sub Q and syndromic management we didn't talk about um, last time. So the first one is what's called a hybrid visit. This is a visit which starts with a telemedicine visit once or twice, and then eventuates uh, consequently uh, in an office visit. So it's a combination of the two. New client calls to request a visit to initiate contraception. She's informed that the clinic is open only in limited circumstances, and that nowadays most visits are done by telemedicine. So if she had an audio video telehealth visit, the, the, she and the uh, clinician discussed available methods, did shared decision-making, the time with the clinician was 27 minutes. The patient chose to have a copper IUD, and after discussion, she verbally consented to place, by the way, I wanna point out here that I know that when you do an IUD placement, you get a consent beforehand and you have the patient sign it. This can be done at, at, in the telemedicine visit. She can actually sign the form um, when she comes into clinic or the clinician can document during the telemedicine visit that the patient verbally consented to the IUD placement. Then she was seen in person for the IUD placement procedure three days later. Because she had kind of a confusing menstrual history, a urine pregnancy test was done, it was negative. And of course, this is a reminder that you don't need to do a pregnancy test for every IUD insertion, but in this case, it was necessary because of her confusing menstrual history. And then she had the placement of a copper IUD without difficulty. So this gets into just a quick review about, um, about the prioritization templates that I mentioned a moment ago. Your clinic should have a written policy that prioritizes which of the client visits 
are going to be done in person as opposed to done rem being done remotely. I'm sure you have this already. But what I want to re remind you about is the need to frequently revise that, probably every week or no less than every two weeks, to revisit that policy. You may need to change things based on local or state physical distancing laws, the availability of staff and uh, personal protective equipment, uh, whether or not uh, your patients are utilizing curbside pickup or your mailing uh, prescriptions and so on. You may remember this uh, prioritization or triage template that I showed you last time, which basically has five different baskets of um, how the front desk might triage different kinds of visits into a, into a telephone uh, visit or a telemedicine visit or to schedule the patient to be seen in, in person. The first column on the left are the types of visits which can be postponed. The next are ones that can be handled by telephone calls, things like method refills or emergency contraception. The third are telemedicine visits, which of course in the past were AV, now could be telephonic as well for things like contraceptive counseling, the patient we just uh, discussed, um, instruction and in how to use depo sub Q, syndromic uh, treatment, uh, I, diagnosis and treatment of sexually transmitted uh, infections and urinary tract infections. We'll come to that in just a minute. Even pregnancy testing and diagnosis can be done in a telemedicine visit. The next column over are things where we do need to see the patient, but they can be scheduled as available. And then the last column over has to do with those circumstances where we really should be trying to see the patient uh, today or tomorrow, uh, if we can, as soon as possible. So first, let's talk about how to build these two visits. First is, remember the first visit, the first interaction we had was a telemedicine visit, visit number one. So point of service is 02. The CPT code is 99203, based on how long that visit was for a new patient. It has a 95 modifier on it. That's the what we did. The reason that we did it was Z30.09, which was for um, counseling and advice on contraception. Then she came back three days later for visit number two, which was her IUD insertion. The point of service is 11, which refers to an office. But I will remind you that if you're a community clinic um, or an FQHC, there are different numbers that your biller uses. What we did was insertion of an IUD and a urine pregnancy test. I've listed the CPT codes for you. I'm sorry, the ICD-10 codes of why we did them, these uh, two Z codes. And then, all, of course, remember that whenever we do an insertion of an IUD or an implant, it's important to include the HICPIC code for the insertion kit, in this case, J7300 for a copper IUD, because your clinic has to be reimbursed for that insertion kit. And you may not realize this, but both Medi-Cal and Family Pack will also pay for the supplies of that IUD insertion. And that's billed as a 58300. The UA uh, modifier indicates that uh, you're billing for supplies that were related for uh, to the insertion. Okay, so that would, that's the answer in terms of, of billing. Just uh, uh, some additional uh, comments, uh, uh, basically, or that the first visit was, because it had video, uh, was the CMS-defined telehealth visit, although it could have been done entirely by telephone based on the policy of June 23rd. And then you'll notice for visit two, when the patient actually came in, that the ICD-10 code is different than it was for the first visit. Now it is the ICD-10 code for doing an IUD placement. Um, and there is no E&M code uh, at the time of the face-to-face -face visit, the in-person visit for the IUD placement, because of the fact that all of the counseling had been done before. He just came into the clinic, got her IUD, and left very quickly. So you build a CPT code for the procedure, but there is no additional uh, e and code. Now, let me take a little sidetrack here just to remind you about the kinds of things that you should be thinking about when you're doing office procedures. So, IUD insertions or removals, um, implant insertions or removals, colposcopy, endometrial biopsies, uh, vulvar biopsies, and so on. What is it that makes transmission of the virus between an infected person and an uninfected person more likely? Here I'm talking about protecting staff and protecting patients. Well, the easy way to remember this is that there are four requirements. Number one is that you have to inhale a large dose of the virus. If you only get a tiny bit of the virus, Either you won't get infected or you might get a viral, a mild case. But if you get a large dose of the virus, a large viral load that you're exposed to, you're more likely to get severe disease. Number two is you have to breathe someone else's air. And that's referred to as their plume. 
So particularly when they talk loudly, they shout, they sing, a plume is expelled with droplets and aerosol fluid in it that could contain high levels of the virus. Next is that's much more likely in an enclosed, poorly ventilated space. And then lastly, there needs to be exposure over an extended period of time. Okay, that if it's very quick, very transient, the likelihood of infection is less likely than it is if it's for a more extended period. So this is the easy way to remember. There is a more complex way of remembering it with a acronym of PET apps. So this tells us about things that are higher risk for transmission and lower risks. And just to remind you about the things that are higher risk is having contact with an infected person within six feet. Um, although there's more recent data which says if a person is singing or shouting that they can project the, the, their fluids even further than six feet that may contain the virus. The E stands for enclosure, so the risk of infection is greater in a small room, particularly one that's poorly ventilated. The time exposure seems to be around 10 minutes, that if it's longer than 10 minutes, the risk of transmission goes up substantially. If it's a very transient exposure, minute or less, then there's much less of, an, of the likelihood of, of, uh, of infection. The A stands for activity. When people are projecting the plume through singing or loud speaking or shouting, it's more likely for someone else to get infected. The next is a P for protection, so higher risk with no hand washing, mask, personal uh, protective equipment, or cough etiquette. The next has to do with prevalence. So transmission is more likely to, uh, to occur if you're in contact with people from high risk groups. That might be a person who works in a meat packing plant or someone who works in a skilled nursing facility, or of course coming into contact with someone who actually has COVID-19 symptoms. The next has to do with silent spreaders. And that's because we've come to realize that the people who are expelling the most virus are the ones who have been infected but they're not symptomatic yet. They're in this pre-symptomatic phase before they get symptoms and they expel most virus, the highest viral loads, in a day or two before their symptoms start. Those are the asymptomatic or the silent uh, shadows, basically. And then the last is a super spreader event. That's many people in close proximity who are not using masks, who are seeing or shouting for extended periods of time. And of course, the classic situation there was a choir practice that occurred up in the state of Oregon. This was, I'm sorry, in the state of Washington. This was uh, described in a morbidity and mortality weekly reports a little while ago of one person in the choir having um, a COVID-19 uh, case, which was asymptomatic at the time, but the majority of people in the choir actually became infected. And that's because of the fact that they were in close proximity, they weren't wearing masks, they were singing, for extended periods of time, and that's how this turned into a super spreader event. So how does that relate to what we do in clinic? Well, in clinic practice, we should try to have as few staff in the room as possible when we do an IED placement or removal or um, with an implant. Try to maintain a physical distance if we can. Use your largest exam room, hopefully one that has negative pressure ventilation. What does that mean? Think about going into a bathroom where you flick on the sand and when it goes on, it sucks the air out of the room. That's negative pressure ventilation. So hopefully you'll have that in at least one of your exam rooms. If you don't, open the windows, as long as it's not too cold outside. Next is time. Minimize the time that the client and staff are in the exam room. Try to limit loud talking. Everybody in the room, patients, staff, clinicians, should all have face masks on. And the clinician who does the IUD placement or the implant placement do consider having a plastic face shield as well, only during the placement, not during the whole visit, but just in case there's any kind of um, either fluid splatter or a lot of, of uh, you know, uh, talking and maybe even shouting going on, the face shield may help. Next is to pre-screen clinic and staff. And of course, initially we asked about shortness of breath, cough and fever. Now we've added to that list chills, sore throat, muscle aches, or a new loss of taste and smell. Next is you might ask your patients whether or not they've had contact with a COVID-19 patient within the last 14 days, or they've participated in what could be a super spreader event within the last about 14 days. So other things that can be done to minimize exposure risk during inpatient visits are remote advanced administration, a registration, counseling and consent, all of this is being done uh, as a tele-visit uh, in advance. 
Number two, have the client wait in her car or outside prior to intake. Screen her for symptoms before the visit and at her arrival uh, to the clinic. And if, if there's any suspicion, then of course you should delay her, her procedure. If she's symptomatic or suspected of, of having had an exposure, better to, um, to refer her uh, for testing. Now, what about doing a screening temperature check? You may have a electronic forehead thermometer that you're using. The CDC now recommends them, uh, but they do have very limited utility. And that's because this misses asymptomatic and some pre-symptomatic people because they just don't have a fever. Or that might be masked by the use of a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug like that. Ibuprofen. Uh, forehead thermometers are prone to inaccurate readings, and the CDC is really clear that we should never use a temperature check as the sole way that we evaluate uh, people for uh, infection before they come into our facility. It should be asking some of the questions that I just mentioned a moment ago. And then again, all staff and clients must wear face masks, ideally a face shield for your clinician who's doing the procedure. Use your largest room, open the windows, um, minimize the number of people in rooms, limit or even prohibit non-client visitors, try to minimize moving between rooms and keep track of your personal protective equipment supply and adjust it um, according. Lastly, for uh, this case study with our patient, she had her copper IUD put in, but she need to come back for a follow-up visit or a screen check. Well, those were considered to be optional even before the public health emergency. Um, the only people that really came in subsequent to an IUD placement sometimes were adolescents or people who had multiple medical conditions just to check and see how they were doing. Nowadays, that can be done as a telemedicine visit. So um, once you've done that IUD placement, schedule a time to talk with her a week or two or maybe a month later about side effects or other problems uh, and be able to give her counseling um, uh, over that, uh, that subsequent televisit rather than having to come back into the clinic. All right, let's do another another hybrid visit. Uh, an established patient wants to speak with a clinician about an implant. It's been in place for a little over four years, and she wants a new one. Uh, she has no side effects or other problems. She had an audio video telehealth visit with a clinician. That took 15 minutes, and after the discussion, she verbally consented to an implant replacement. So she was seen in person for that procedure five days later. The expired next one was removed uh, and replaced without difficulty, okay? Now, first off, I wanna remind you, I did this last time, but I wanna update this a little bit, that given the fact that this patient had had her implant in for four and a half years, there was no pressing need to have her replace it now. We, of course, gave her that option, but it did not have to be done that way. In the middle column, you'll see how long LARC methods are FDA approved. And in the far column, you see the evidence-based duration of action. So it probably would have been reasonable to at least offer her replacement of her next one at five years, um, rather than the FDA approved three years. I also want, want to uh, point out the fact that within the last few months, both Liletta and Morena have now been FDA approved for a six year duration although evidence says that they'll work for a full seven years. So again, in order to keep patients out of the clinic, if she's had her Bilet or Morena for six years, they can actually push to another year if they want to. And remember, if you're using Depo-IM or Depo-Sub-Q, that the outer limit of giving those injections uh, is at 15 weeks. The benchmark is to give, give the injections at the 13 weeks, but they can be pushed to as long as every um, 15 weeks. So the way that we are going to bill for this visit is the first visit, remember, was a telehealth visit of an established patient. It's a 99213 with a 95 modifier. The reason for the visit was surveillance of an implantable subdermal contraceptive. Then the second visit was when she came into the office for the swap. Removal of the expired implant, the insertion of the new one. Remember that in family pack, you use two separate codes, 11981 for insertion. 119764 removal. Um, the ICD-10 code for that, again, is Z30.46. And the supplies are the HIT-PIT code for the insertion kit, J7307. And then, again, you will be paid for the removal supplies, 11976 with a UA modifier. Um, the, you know, there is payment um, uh, for the supplies that have to do uh, with the removal. All right, a quick case study that has to do with Depo-Sub-Q, and we did this um, with Dr. Carlin last time, but I'll give you a little update on this. 
uh, that we didn't talk about the billing. So Ms. B is a 30-year-old established client who's been using Depo Provera IM every 13 weeks for the last two years. She called for an appointment two weeks before her next injection was due, but she was hesitant to come in. So she had an AV telehealth visit, a 15-minute discussion with a clinician about her alternatives. Of course, that could have been done telephonically only. And at the end of that 15-minute discussion, she decided to try self-injection of, of Depo Sub-Q. Uh, one unit was delivered to her curbside at a pharmacy to Ms. B. And so the question was, did she have any alternative, other alternatives to the use of Depo IM? And how are we going to code this with? Well, remember that there are a number of alternatives for our patients who are using Depo IM, who like it, want to continue, but who may have concerns about actually coming to the clinic. So the default is she can have an in-person visit, have her IM injection of Depo Provera in the clinic. We try to get her in and out as quickly as possible. The second is she can have an in-person visit, but a curbside injection. And there are quite a number of family planning clinics who have now developed the capability of having the patient drive into the parking lot. You verify who the patient is, and then a staff member wearing appropriate um, uh, personal protective equipment literally goes out to the patient's car, gives her her depot injection while she's sitting on the driver's side or on the passenger side um, without actually coming into the clinic. She can make a switch to self-injected Depo Sub-Q, or she can switch to what's called a bridge mask. Progestin-only pills, a combined hormonal method, a pill patch ring, uh, or to a barrier method until the public health emergency uh, is over with. Now, if you weren't with us last time when we talked about Depo Sub-Q, remember that it comes as a pre-filled, ready-to-use uh, injector with a needle, can be used at home so the client is in control of it, and it uses a short small needle that's injected into skin instead of into muscle, and therefore it's potentially less pain. And that's particularly true um, because of the fact that uh, it, it's really a very non-threatening needle, quite honestly, given the fact that it's so short um, uh, and a sharp uh, skinning 26 gauge needle. Also remember that Depo Sub-Q has 30% less hormone. Depo IM is 150 milligrams. Depo sub Q is 104 milligrams, and therefore people may have fewer side effects when they use it. Some clients have experienced local site irritation and soreness in the first few injections. That does have a tendency to uh, go away over time. And then also just to remind you about Depo sub Q, sub -Q the contraindications and side effects are about the same uh, between Depo sub Q and Depo IM. We don't need to adjust the dosage of Depo sub Q or depo IM based on body mass index, but we really do need to use clinical judgment in deciding whether self-injection of depo sub Q at home is really the appropriate method for this patient. You have to be fairly confident after speaking with her about the fact that she's comfortable injecting herself with a, with a needle at home without a clinician around, or um, if she's uncomfortable with that, then having a family member or a partner learning the technique of doing the injection. Now, of course, there are lots of other drugs that are injected at home, I mean, fertility drugs, uh, drugs for multiple sclerosis. Um, sometimes people have to use low, low molecular weight heparin and, um, and other types of injections at home. So there's nothing revolutionary about this, it's a, especially given the fact that it's a short, skinny needle. People can learn this pretty uh, quickly and be comfortable, but you shouldn't do this routinely for all of your depo patients. You really have to check with the patient to make sure that she's comfortable in doing this. By the way, there are quite a few resources out there, to, both to educate yourself and your patients about Sub-Q Depo Provera in the package insert. NIFRA's developed a nice um, fact sheet on self-administration of Depo, so has Bedsider. And the Reproductive Health Access Project has actually developed um, an explanation of how to do uh, Depo Sub-Q in about 10 different languages, uh, and those are free and available. Um, through the link that you see uh, in front of you. So how are we going to bill for this one? Well, the telemedicine visit is a 99213 with a 95 modifier, given the fact that it was a telemedicine visit. The point of service is 02. The ICD-10 code is Z30.42, which is surveillance of an injectable contraceptive. She's already using Depo Provera. But this is a, an appropriate time to remind you about the fact that while Family Pact and Medi-Cal cover self-administration of Depo sub-Q. They will do so only when it's dispensed 
by a pharmacy during the public health emergency. So in other words, if you had Depo sub Q available in your clinic, you can administer it in your clinic, but you can't dispense that to a patient to use at home. The Medi-Cal policy that I've included um, in references at the end is really quite clear that it's only pharmacies which are authorized to dispense Depo, Depo sub Q um, injectors uh, to patients um, rather than the clinic being able uh, to do that uh, during the public health emergency. That may change over time, but that's where we stand now. All right, one last case, and there's some very important information here about sexually transmitted infection screening that I want to tell you about. So hopefully you can hang on with me for at least another 10 minutes. So this is Ms. L, who has a 35-year-old established client who states that she develops a vaginal discharge, which has a malodor, every a couple of months. She was diagnosed with bacterial vaginosis 18 months ago. Since then, she's been treated four times, each time with a different topical drug. And we all know that BV has a tendency to recur. Each treatment improves the malodor for a while, and she's actually started doing vaginal douching to manage the malodor. However, due to the public health emergency, she would like to avoid an in-person visit. She had a telehealth visit, let's say either by phone or audio video, that lasted for 27 minutes. And at the end of that, she was prescribed metronidazole vaginal gel suppression, and she picked up two tubes of medication curbside at the clinic. Not at a pharmacy, but at the clinic. So this brings up a topic that we have not discussed before, which has to do with what's called syndromic um, diagnosis and treatment of sexually transmitted infections. In other words, based on history, a description of physical signs, but without actually being able to do laboratory tests. I will tell you about that in just a minute, but I want to remind you of something that was posted on the Family Pack website about a week ago. And that is that the CDC issued a letter on September 3rd, which pointed out the fact that there is a current shortage of uh, sexually transmitted infection test kits and laboratory supplies, most notably for the gonorrhea and chlamydia and NAT test. I don't know if you've been um, working with laboratories that have complained about this shortage, but apparently it is a national issue. There's a pretty good reason, and that is that most laboratories, particularly the companies that produce these tests, but also the laboratories that do them, have had to switch over and devote so much time and effort and focus on, on uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, viral testing or antibody testing that they now have not been able to put as many resources into producing STD tests. So what this um, CDC letter said, and by the way, I've included a link for you at the bottom with so you can go to the CDC letter, it's about four pages long, and I think it's something you should read, is that it tells you that if testing kits for gonorrhea and chlamydia are in short supply, that there is a priority of who should be given these tests for screening, okay? And of course, they point out that for females, for people who have a vagina, that this should be done with a vaginal swab rather than a cervical swab or a urine sample. So they basically say that when we do routine screening of females under 25, targeted screening of women 25 and older. Remember that is patients who have had more than one sex partner in the last 12 months, people who have had a new sex partner in the last 90 days, people who have reason to believe that their partner is having sex with someone else or someone who's had an STD within the last two years. Those are all circumstances of females 25 and older who should be screened. They point out that screening the throat and the anus um, routinely is not recommended for females, but based on those practices could be. And for men having sex with men to prioritize rectal and pharyngeal screening above urine-based testing of the urethra, because in men having sex with men, it's more likely that the rectum or pharynx will be positive. Okay, and they say if there's a severe shortage of supplies, prioritize rectal testing over pharyngeal testing. Now, there is also additional information in the CDC letter that goes into using these tests as a diagnostic test, not only as a, as a, a screening test. But I just wanted to put this on your radar screen that this may be a problem that you may be notified by your lab of the fact that they're running out of test kits for gonorrhea and chlamydia. And so the CDC has given you guidance about who has priority uh, for either screening or diagnosis of gonorrhea or chlamydia. 
One other thing to mention, and I just found out about this this morning, there was a report last week at an SPD meeting about the fact that as a result of many, many fewer office visits, including sexually transmitted disease clinics, that there has been a significant drop in cases of gonorrhea reported versus those that are projected. So if you look at the dotted line, it's expected reports for gonorrhea. And by the way, this is CDC data nationally. And if you look at the green bars, you can see this really sharp drop off in March, April, May, and June of reported cases of gonorrhea. Probably doesn't mean there's less gonorrhea being transmitted, but it does mean that people are not coming in um, to their usual sites of care to have gonorrhea and chlamydia screening performed. Uh, so it's something that we really need to, uh, uh, to continue to consider that we don't want to have, you know, people staying away from clinics actually lead to this sort of echo problem of now undiagnosed and untreated cases of gonorrhea um, and chlamydia. It looks like that might actually be having, happening to some degree. So let's finish up with uh, the patient we were just talking about. Remember she had what sounded like recurrent bacterial vaginosis. And what syndromic management means basically is diagnosis and treatment based upon a best guess of symptoms and a dis uh, description of physical findings, but without the use of laboratory tests. Studies primarily in Africa show that this is fairly sensitive as a way of making a correct diagnosis, especially for bacterial vaginosis and candidal vaginitis, kind of more plus minus for a rash that could or might not be herpes. It's not very specific, which means that when you're giving your best guess about the diagnosis of this STD, that you may err on the side of over-diagnosing and over-treating. But we feel that that's better than just missing the diagnosis. Uh, all together. Now, here's something that might help with our patient. I won't read the whole thing, but I'll tell you how it works. And that is that it looks at a variety of symptoms and signs of a vaginal discharge. Does she complain of itching and burning, bad odor in the discharge? Is it frothy or bubbling? What color is it? And each of Canada trichomoniasis bacterial vaginosis, PIV, which is Disquamative inflammatory vaginitis or just a normal physiologic discharge have its own kind of unique combination of itching, burning, odor, frothiness, and color. And so use something like this as a way of getting a best guess as to what her vaginal infection is, even if you're not able to do uh, testing. So what the CDC tells us is that if we're thinking about a recurrence of bacterial vaginosis or candidiasis, we treat based on what we learn telephonically or in a telemedicine visit. Um, on the other hand, if it's a brand new problem, patient hasn't been diagnosed with those, we get, need to get a better history, a thorough history via a telehealth visit, and then consider empiric treatment. So, for example, the CDC recommends that if a patient has a malodorous discharge, suggestive of bacterial vaginosis or trichomoniasis, both of which have sort of a fishy odor, to treat with metronidazole for a week, and it will treat either one without having the patient come to the clinic and having a look at the vaginal discharge under the microscope. If she has vulvar irritation or itching and a white discharge, chances are really good that this is um, vulval vaginal candidiasis. So treat her with fluconazole, 150 milligrams orally, or a three-day topical uh, antifungal. And only if it fails, um, then she might need to come in. Now, I also mentioned this last time, and that is that some clinics have used curbside um, interactions for pickup and drop off of vaginal discharge sampling kits. So let's say, for example, we treated the patient I just talked about with even more metronidazole gel. She called back and said, you know what? I'm not getting better. And normally what we would do is to say, come on in, we'll have a look and we'll take a sample of the vaginal discharge and look at the, under the microscope. So what could be done is to collect some um, plastic or glass tubes where you can put a stopper put in a cc of fresh saline, get a pack of cotton tip swabs, put that in a brown paper bag. And then the paper, I'm sorry, the patient comes to the clinic and a staff member will take that to her car. And if you really wanted to avoid a face-to-face -face interaction with the patient, once you've identified that that's actually her and her car, you can literally put it on her hood. The um, staff member walks away and the patient gets out of the car, picks up the sampling kit. Then what she does is go home, she samples her vaginal walls, put the swab in the test tube, put a cap on it, and then brings it back to the clinic and the clinician can look at it under the microscope. You can also do that to sample for gonorrhea and chlamydia 
with appropriate collection containers, the one that you're, uh, you're routinely using for your GC and Chlamydia nets. But there's no reason why a person couldn't sample themselves at home. Then they take that sample back to you in the clinic and you send it to the lab as you normally would. Now for a patient with a recurrent bacterial vaginosis, does she need to be screened or treated for gonorrhea and chlamydia? And the CDC guidelines don't recommend empiric treatment for GC and chlamydia just because she has a vaginal discharge. But the point is, is that if in her history she meets one of the criteria that I mentioned earlier, she's under 25, she um, has multiple partners or a new partner or has reason to believe that her partner is having sex with someone else, then I would evaluate not only her vaginal discharge, but I'd also have her sample herself for gonorrhea and chlamydia from her own vaginal fluid and then drop that off um, at the clinic uh, as well. So how are we gonna build this very last visit then? The answer is, is that um, the telephonic uh, or um, telemedicine visit is a 99214, um, basically based on the amount of time that it took the diagnosis is N76.1, subacute and chronic vaginitis. Interestingly, bacterial vaginosis does not have its own ICD-10 code, so we have to use N76.1. And um, if Family Pact is going to pay for the metronidazole gel, if you use the generic version of the gel, um, the PICPIC code, which is used, is S5000. If you use a brand name of metronidazole gel, it's S501, and both are, are uh, covered. Uh, in the uh, uh, in the formulary of family pet. One very last slide, and this is kind of a preview of what you're going to be seeing later in the year and into next year. And that is that E and M coding is going to change substantially in 2001. Remember, nowadays the way that we choose an E and M code is either on the basis of history, physical, medical decision making, or time. Well, in 2021, what's going to change is you will either base the e &M code on medical decision making, history and physical are no longer counted, or time. But there is a new definition of time. The new definition of time starting January 1st, 2021, or you will hear from Medi-Cal and Family Pact about the start date, is the time it takes for you to prepare to see the patient that is reviewing test results, getting a history, performing a medically appropriate exam, giving a patient counseling and education, the time it takes you to document that information in her health record, to actually look up test results and care coordination. So you will get credit for far more things than you currently get credit for now in regard to time, because now you can only bill for face-to-face -face time. But when this starts next year, you get credit for much more. Now I will say that the time frames will have changed. So you'll need to change either your electronic medical record or the forms you use in computing the NM codes because you'll, you can do more things with the time that you have and you'll get credit for it, but you'll have to use these new time frames as a way of, of um, figuring out what the correct e and code is. But that's not now, that's not until January of um, January 1st of 2021 or later, we'll wait until Medi-Cal and Family Pack tell us that that uh, is official. So with that, I will go ahead and uh, wrap up. We actually have the full 20 minutes for questions and uh, I, I look forward to being able to answer them for you. Okay, wonderful. So um, I've been assigning all the questions to you in the questions box, uh, but before you get to those, we did have one question uh, that came in through email. So I'm just gonna read that up real quick for you, Dr. Folakar. Um, are you ready? Yes. Okay. So I am a family pack provider for over 18 years. I have two clinics and one of my clinics uh, family pack application is still pending due to COVID pandemic, waiting for site visit to be completed and approved. In your lecture, you mentioned a provider can provide care at any locations due to the pandemic. In that case, may I see patients at my clinic that the application is still pending for? Um, well, so what I was talking about was specifically in a telehealth visit. Okay, and that the clinician can either be in the clinic at home or somewhere else. Um, the way that I understand the question is you're talking about providing face-to-face -face care at a clinic which has not been formally approved by the Office of Family Planning yet for face-to-face -face services. So, no, I would not include that as something which you could do. What I'm saying is very specifically for telehealth visits that the patient can be 
at home or somewhere else, or that the clinician can be at home or somewhere else, but that's only in the context of a telehealth system. Uh, okay, so let me look at some of the other questions. Not not a huge number, but let's see. Family pack has been denied, and and I will tell you in advance. Even though I'm going to read these, um, for a lot of these denials, it's something that you're going to have to talk with OSP staff about, or the staff of the fiscal intermediary, because um, you know when when denials happen, there are just so many reasons that that might be the case. And of course, I'm not familiar with all the denial codes, but. It says the Family Pact has denied all 99201 telehealth visits we have uh, we've billed. Is is anyone else having that um, problem? Um, I don't know. We'll have we'll have to we'll have to see about that. I'm not sure why they would have been denied, but um, uh, that that's definitely one that I that I would think about appealing and trying to find out from the fiscal intermediary about why that's happening. Next question that I would see, another one about a denial code of 0225. And again, I'm not going to be able to help out with that. You should call the fiscal intermediary or email the Office of Family Planning. What if the patient's out of state since Family Pact is a federal program? Now, it really only applies to people that are Family Pact beneficiaries uh, uh, that reside in California. Now, if a Family Pact beneficiary was, let's say, visiting a relative in Reno, for example, and called in um, to your clinic wanting a visit, given the fact that her site of care is in someone's home out of state, um, in Reno or Phoenix or somewhere else, but she's formerly a family pack program, or a family pack um, enrollee, um, then in that circumstance, as long as you documented it, I don't think there would be any problem there. The, clinic, the clinician, of course, has to be licensed in California, it has to be a patient who is a um, resident of California. She just happens to be out of state uh, at the time of this uh, of this telehealth visit. And of course, she is interacting with a family pack clinic for the telehealth visit. And I think that that part of it would be um, acceptable. Uh, let's see. So they can be anywhere. However, they need to be in the same state or the same state where the provider can legally practice. I, well, I think I just answered that. And that is that the clinician has to be in state. They have to be licensed in California. In fact, they have to be a family packed um, enrolled clinician uh, in order to be able to conduct this telehealth visit. Uh, and the patient, of course, has to be a California resident, has to be enrolled in family uh, when she has this. So I read that place of service 02 is for a professional claim. We're submitting institutional claims. And instead of place of service 02, we've learned that we should use revenue code uh, 0780. Does this sound right? Um, I, I uh, quite honestly do not know the answer to that. And what I would do is to look at that communication of June 23rd that I mentioned. Just click on the link. It's quite lengthy. Um, and we'll probably have that answer um, for you. I missed, uh, let's see, if we can or cannot initiate the appointment. Well, the, the point here with these telemedicine calls uh, is, is the fact that they are, they are intended to be where the patient calls in and requests having, having an appointment. So in other words, it's not supposed to work in such a way that the clinic calls the patient and, and tries to initiate a visit in that way. And what I'm, what I'm talking about here, and I'm, what my assumption is, is that this was an was a effort to try to avoid fraud. Because something that could happen fraudulently is that a clinic hypothetically could call a patient, could ask, how are you doing? Um, how's your method of contraception going? A ask a bunch of questions, hang up the phone, and then and then build a family pack for them. That, that's not considered to be acceptable. It has to be a visit which is initiated by the patient where the patient calls up and says, I want an appointment, and then there's some discussion about whether that can be a telehealth visit or whether it should be a face-to-face -face visit or a combination of the two. Now, certainly, a clinic could call a patient and say, you know, we know you were scheduled for your well-woman visit um, in May. That didn't happen. Um, would you like to be able to reschedule the appointment so we can see you in October? That would be perfectly reasonable to do that, but of course, you just can't bill for that. That's the front desk calling the patient 
asking whether or not they're uh, interested in scheduling a visit. That that's that's not a health visit. That's um, the sort of um, more uh, administrative uh, than anything else. But in in order to actually initiate the need for the visit, that has to come from the patient rather than having um, to come from rather than coming from the practice itself. Next question is: Does G2012 require a modifier? And the answer to that is no. Um, it doesn't. G2010 uh, and G2012, both of them virtual check-in visits, do not require a modifier. Next is we're not being paid, but we're receiving denials for G2025. And I can't quite read that whole cloud there with a RAD code of 9993. I, um, so. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not familiar with with um, the HICPIC code of G2025. Okay, because what we're talking about, what I'm referring to here as the virtual check-in codes are G2010 and G2012. G2025 may be another um, medical HICPIC code. I don't think it's a family pack HICPIC code. Uh, and uh, so we'll have to do a little more research. I'll I'll try to put that in the written Q and A afterwards if I can find out a little bit more about what the G2025 is and why that would be um, denied in family pact. Uh, and I'm not in any situation to be able to tell you about that for, um, for family pact. Let's see, does billing, and unless of course, and again, I don't have the whole manual in front of me. Uh, G20, I wonder if G2025 is something that has to do with the facility codes. And that is for some telehealth visits that are initiated in a facility, and this is, not since the public health emergency, it was long before that, um, that um, in the kind of more traditional way of doing telehealth, not only could you bill for the clinician interaction, but in some cases, a facility code, particularly in a hospital, uh, could be billed uh, as well. But, uh, and I'm not sure if that's what the G2025 is referring to. Let's see, does um, billing a telehealth visit, audiovisual or telephonic, as the E&M service also apply to FQHCs. Uh, we bill on a UV with the 95 modifier be uh, required. And again, what I'm going to refer you to is the um, is the Medi-Cal policy of June 23rd. There are about four or five pages that are specifically for FQHCs. You need to read that, um, understand it. Uh, because of the fact that they really made the effort working with CMS in Washington to make sure that CM, that uh, FQHCs are, uh, as well as rural clinics and Indian health service clinics are addressed in a very specific way. Uh, and uh, not only because that's not my area of expertise, but, but I think that's a whole lecture. So um, that, that's something where you really know, need to look at the original policy to find out about how you're going to be billing that as an FQHC. I hate to give you uh, incorrect information. Does one need to be a family pack provider in order to sign up a patient for family pack? And the answer is, well, your, your practice has to be enrolled as a family pack providing practice in order to be able to do enrollments. Now, you do know, or you may know, that of course enrollments in the past always had to be done face to face. And starting in March, and I talked about this in the previous rep webinar, not in this one, but the point is you can do enrollment of patients in the family pack based on a telephonic or AZ conversation uh, with that patient. So now you can do that, at least temporarily, in a way that doesn't require the patient to come into the clinic to complete the enrollment forms, okay? Um, and, and it's easy to find that. It, it is, uh, it's listed in my references for you at, at the end. Uh, it's part of the FAQ document that was published in March. Um, however, you have to be a family pack provider in order to do that. If you're not a family pack provider, uh, you have to be enrolled as a family pack provider in order to be able to do that. And if another part of that from Rebecca was we had not yet enrolled, the answer is no, you can't you can't do that um, until until you are formally enrolled. Which conditions are best for telehealth and which would not be? Well, here I'm going to refer you back to the and I went I went through it quickly. Uh, to that prioritization template that I showed you. And by the way, I developed a three or four page, what's called a job aid for the Family Planning National Training Center, FPNTC, on how to, how to develop these prioritizations um, uh, templates for, so for family planning services. 
So when you go to that slide or when you look at the references that are in my slide, go to the FPMTC section. There will be a link that you can click on about prioritization of patient visits. Click on that and you will get very detailed um, uh, advice and instructions about which services you can do, do by telehealth and which services you have to do in person. And again, I absolutely want to reiterate the fact that that is a moving target. You are going to start with a template which is best for your clinic. It's what you have enough staff to do. It's what you have enough clinicians to do. It's what you have enough uh, personal protective equipment for. It's what's going on in your community in terms of, you know, what the prevalence of positive test is and that sort of thing. And it's something that's going to change over time. And I really want to emphasize again that once you put together that template, that grid, that policy or protocol in your office about what can go to telehealth, what has to go to an in-person visit, you have to revisit that every couple of weeks and update it for what the conditions are uh, in your community. So another one then is our center doesn't have any policies in place for which visits um, should be remote. Do you have um, do you have a policy that uses a reference? Yeah, it's the one that I just mentioned. Um, and in fact, what I may try to do in a minute, once I do a couple of more questions, and um, let's see, maybe I can get some help um, with uh, with uh, staff members from the training centers to get my slides back up. But if they are, I will show you the reference that I'm talking about that has to do with um, uh, with uh, putting together templates. Okay, let's see. I can find any more. And by the way, whatever questions I don't get to, um, but we usually uh, do a written uh, Q&A, which we'll post on the website afterwards. Okay, what are the five criteria mentioned as the, what we need to document to show that the telephone visit is appropriate? Um, it'll be in the slide set, uh, number one. And number two, and what, which is far more important, is that it's on page seven of the policy. So if you click on the link for the policy, it's very quick and easy to download it. You go to page seven and eight, in the policy, you'll see exactly what those questions are. I've given you a shortcut to those five criteria in the slide set, but I'm not going to go back to the slides now and repeat them. Uh, let's see, are there any um, different or special considerations for services provided for minors? And the answer to that is the ones that we've always dealt with um, in providing family planning services to minors, you know, the issue of whether they're emancipated minors or not, what their, what their age is, it really applies to telemedicine as well. The only thing that I would say for telemedicine with, um, with adolescents is I would really make a point of discussing with them the confidentiality and security of where they're having this conversation um, early on, upfront. And what I mean by that is, is that um, you know, normally what I would say is, can you hear me? Can you see me? But I mean, if I'm having this with a, with a conversation with an adolescent, I would be asking questions like, is there anybody in the room next door? Are you comfortable with the fact that there's nobody else with you that is listening in? Or is there someone else that you want in the room with you? Or is there anything else that we can do to make sure that this is confidential as possible? You know, we've, we've all been seeing reports about the fact that uh, interpersonal violence uh, has been going up. Uh, as a result of people being completely stressed out by what we're going through with the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and, um, you know, so when we do these telemed telemedicine visits, we really need to take into account that that's something that we need to bring up with patients about whether there has been interpersonal violence and also to check in with them about in this conversation we're having, either by AV or by telephone, are they comfortable with the fact that this is being done in a uh, an environment which is confidential for them. Next is for documentation of time in the telephonic visit, should the start time and the stop start time be documented or just the time spent? And the answer is just the time spent. I mean, I think it's perfectly fine to document start and start, start time and stop time. Then what you'll do from there is to calculate the appropriate um, level of the ENM code. But it's just as reasonable to say this was a 25 minute visit and you don't need to document start and stop. Next is, can a patient bring in her urine for gonorrhea and chlamydia testing? Um, vaginal swab was mentioned. Well, she could. I mean, that, that's, that's a possibility. It, it, the, the reality though is that the CDC says very clearly that the sensitivity 
particularly the sensitivity of the gonorrhea and chlamydia in that test is substantially better with a vaginal swab than it is with a urine sample. Um, there's a significant drop-off in the accuracy with a urine sample in women, uh, and therefore the vaginal swab is better. But if the vaginal swab is, is impossible, patient's not um, comfortable with it and so on, uh, then you could use uh, urine as, as, a, uh, uh, as a substitute. But you'd rather go with a vaginal swab. Next is, where can we find the telehealth rates? That's a great question. So first off, if you're using the e &M codes that I mentioned, standard e &M codes, new patient, established patient, based on time, 95 modifier, those payments are exactly what you would get for an office visit, okay? And for one thing. Next is, you also may want to know what the payments are for the virtual check-in visits that I mentioned, which have been added on. Okay. So if you want to know what the payment is for anything that's covered in Medi-Cal, anything that's covered in Family Pack, you go to the medical.ca.gov website, or you go to the general Medi-Cal website. And then in the, in the question box, or the search box is a better way to say it, what you type in is Medi-Cal rates. And then that will take you to a page where it says you've hit the Medi-Cal rates page, you want to download all the rates. You, need, you just want to do a lookup of a particular rate. So you're going to click, I want to do a lookup of a particular rate. Okay, and in that circumstance, what you're going to do is you're going to type in G2020 or G2012. It's going to take you to a big table, and it will tell you exactly what the medical rate is to pay, pay for that. Or if you want to know where you're going to be paid for an IUD case or a colposcopy or anything else, you will find specific Medi-Cal rates in those tables. Thank goodness Medi-Cal is very transparent about the CPT codes that are covered. If, the, if it's not listed and it's not a covered benefit, if it is covered, they will tell you exactly what the payment is. But you will find that on the Medi-Cal um, uh, .ca.gov uh, webpage. Let's see, um, can we use symptomatic diagnosis for a family pack televisit? And secondary diagnosis, foul smelling, discharge, or vaginal itchiness instead of acute vaginitis or uh, subacute vaginitis. Okay, so I'm really glad that question was asked because I have to remind you about a couple of things in billing for family pack visits. You probably know this, but I'm going to remind you as well. Whenever you bill for a family pack visit, you always have to have at least one ICD 10 diagnosis which is the method of contraception that the patient is using. And then usually there's a second ICD-10 diagnosis if you're doing something like screening for an STD or treating an STD um, or let's say a bleeding problem or something like that. So here in the example that Catherine is giving is that a person has a telemedicine visit because she has a foul smelling vaginal discharge, it turns out to be bacterial vaginosis. What are the ICD-10 codes that you use for that? Okay, well one is, you have to have the ICD-10 code for whatever method she's using. So if she's using pill-packed ring, then you're going to use the ICD-10 codes respectively for each of those. If she has an IUD in place, you're going to list that code, um, maintenance of an IUD, and so on. And then the secondary diagnosis is what the diagnosis is of her condition. So if you made the diagnosis of BV, then you use the code for bacterial vaginosis in 76.1. If she only has a discharge and you're not sure what's going on, then there's probably going to be a separate code for that. And Family Pack is very, very um, transparent in the acceptable ICD-10 codes. If you look in the PPBI, the Patient um, Policies, Procedures, and Billing Instructions, for every method, for every STD which is covered, for every service which is covered, they list quite explicitly the ICD-10 codes that are considered to be covered or not covered in family pack. So the point is, is that in addition to the ICD-10 code for what method of contraception, which is mandatory, it's got to be on every single claim, then in addition, you would choose a secondary diagnosis code, which is the best description of what you've diagnosed or what you suspect is going on or what her complaint was, but it has to come from that list of available codes um, in the family pack PPBI. Uh, let's see, I'm just looking at time. We're at 1.30, uh, let's see. Yeah. 
Okay, well, what I'm going to do is um, uh, there are a, just a handful of more questions that I didn't get to, but but the point is is um, the fact that I will answer these in a written Q and A. Um, one that I'll look at very quickly is the very last one: Are BP tests blood pressure tests required for birth control pills in deep and DMPA refills? And uh, the answer it is absolutely not for DMPA. We, there's no requirement of checking blood pressure for pill patch and ring. Um, whenever you're initiating uh, a an estrogen containing method, or when you refill a prescription for those methods, you'd at least like to ask about blood pressure, but it's not required that the patient come in for a blood pressure or that she show you a blood pressure reading. She can tell you that, or she can say, look, I just have no way of getting a blood pressure, and then you can say, okay, well, we'll give you a three-month uh, grace period to have your blood pressure checked. And I'll put a little bit more of that into the written q and Okay, Nicole, I see you're back. Yeah, no, I've been going through, I've been feeling the questions and trying to answer some of them to help you out. <laughs> um, but thank you so much. So yeah, that uh, concludes our webinar. We we're right on time at 1.30. Um, so please remember to fill out the survey that will appear at the end once this webinar ends, so we can get your feedback so we know what kind of future content to provide. I'm sure everyone was really excited. We've been getting really good feedback about this webinar. This information was so much needed. Thank you so much, Dr. Polakar. Um, oh, yeah. And so yeah, let's have let me oh, ask you one question. They have said it and I missed it, but how can people get access to the handout? Yes, yes. So we are getting the handouts. This webinar is recorded, and so we will be sending that out in follow up emails uh, with the slides and the list of questions that, if we did, any questions that Dr. Pokar didn't get a chance to answer, we'll send that out as well. So um, with that, thank you so much, Dr. Pokar, for presenting, and thank you to you all for joining us today. We hope you stay safe and have a great rest of your week. Great. Thank, okay. thank you. Bye, everyone. Take care.